couple things here. We're just about done with this chapter. There is a thing called a trade fixture. Now, I've got a really cool example of this, but since we are no longer at the school, I really can't do this one. A trade fixture is a fixture that's used in the course of business or by a tenant in their trade of work. I guess I could literally just go, you know, here's an example right here. That camera, this laptop, this screen might appear to be personal property, but I'm using it in such a manner. Well, this is actually not a really good example because it is a laptop. Let me go back to the one that I would normally do in class. And those are the big whiteboards that I have got attached to the wall of the school. And I do all of this stuff on the whiteboard if we were truly sitting live in classroom. Those whiteboards or chalkboard for us older people would be a natural trade fixture. A true fixture, like a ceiling fan, my house, my fixture, that is a fixture. A trade fixture typically is my personal property attached to someone else's, i.e. the landlord property. That's a big difference. A regular fixture is my house, my ceiling fan. Trade fixture, my whiteboards on uh, Andy's real property, his house, even though it's a business. Deli uh, cabinets that may be built in. That could be a trade fixture. Pizza ovens in a trade fixture. Walden books may have book shelves built under the walls. Those could be trade fixtures. Trade fixtures need to be removed by the end of my lease if I'm taking them with me. If I fail to remove a trade fixture, which is personal property, it then becomes the landlord's property by leaving it in there. And because it has been affixed in such a manner that it looks permanent, and what did we call personal to real? was called annexation, right? If it goes from the tenant's personal to the landlord's real, they call that constructive annexation. It's in your book, constructive annexation. Page 27, right at the very last paragraph, or the very first paragraph, very last line. The other sight word they love is the word accession. So not only is it changing styles from personal to real, it's changing ownerships as well. I've got a good friend of mine named Brady Clements who owns Skyline Properties. He has got a warehouse of stuff that have been left that he has acquired. Matter of fact, I have gone shopping in his warehouse. Hey, I need a desk, hey, I need a chair. He's got deli cabinets, he's got coffee makers, he's got all kinds of stuff that had been left by the tenants. Are we running okay, thumbs up? Any questions? Remember, I understand that we are doing this a little differently since we're not sitting in live, and it appears that some of you may be shy. Don't, do not forget, we've got a chat button for you. If you'd rather chat me a question, you can email me, raymond at realuniversity.com. Send me a text. Remember, send me a text. If you send me a text, just tell me who it is at first, because I, that's going to be my first question, so that I understand who I'm talking to. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is the legal system. Please do not practice law. The Indiana Bar Association loves nothing more than suing attorneys and bringing charges against them for a, a real estate agent, and they call it holding yourself out as an attorney. If you start giving legal advice, 
That is considered holding yourself out for an attorney. You do not even need to get paid to be considered practicing law. There are people that have tried to defend themselves. Well, it was just advice and I didn't get paid for it. Doesn't matter. You cannot practice law. The violation can be a misdemeanor. It can actually be construed as a felony if you practice law. You can get fined up to $5,000 and five years in jail if you're practicing law. So please do not practice law. Get used to saying, and you will hear me say many times, I am not a practicing attorney, but here's what I think. I'm not a practicing attorney, but here's what I've seen. Yeah, I'm not a practicing attorney, but here's my guess. Follow that up with, if you have more questions, contact your attorney so that you can get a, a valid answer. Because I certainly don't want to get accused of practicing law. The Indiana Bar Association actually sued the Indiana Association of Realtors way back in 1963. Sounds like a long time ago, doesn't it? That was the year I was born in 1963. <clears throat> the Indiana Bar Association sued the Indiana Association of Realtors, claiming that realtors were in fact practicing law by discussing and talking about purchase agreements and listing agreements and all this. This lawsuit went all the way up to the Indiana Supreme Court and they ruled that if a person is merely filling in blanks on a pre-printed form and you have sufficient education to understand what that blank is intended to be, then you are in fact not practicing law. That is one of the reasons why you're getting this education so that you understand sufficiently at least what that blank means when it says purchase price to be blank and you go in and write, okay, I know what that blank means and I've been educated sufficiently enough to understand what we're offering. So in fact, here's another misnomer that you hear agents do all of the time. Well, I gotta go fill out a, gotta go uh, write a purchase agreement tonight. No, 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 you're not. You're actually filling in 27 blanks in a pre-printed form that was written by an attorney and you have sufficient education to understand, I'm gonna write that purchase price and I'm gonna write their last name and I'm gonna write the address, and I understand what those blanks mean, but all of this crud that's out here, between there, I didn't write, the attorney wrote. I'm just filling in the blanks that he is guiding me on. So do not practice law, do not get caught practicing law, don't write contracts. The problem is this, you are the closest thing to an attorney that your client's going to see probably in every deal. In New York, they actually use attorneys to negotiate. Real estate agents basically are glorified marketing people. We market the property, we get an offer, we turn that offer to, over to the seller or buyer's attorney and let them deal with it. In Indiana, we kind of help our client answer offers write counter offers, things of that nature. So you will have to understand license law, agency law, contract law, environmental law, zoning law, all of these things that you may give insight to, of course, followed up with, but check with your attorney so that you're not construed. We can't practice law even though we are subjected to many different types of law in our industry that you will have to deal with. Contract law being the most common one. And you may have already seen this, but I love this. I actually showed this to an attorney friend of mine who's in the Bible study class. He had never seen this. This is probably my favorite one. Let's eat, Grandma.
That sentence is an invitation to your grandmother to come over and take dinner. That sentence is now premeditated murder. Let's eat grandma. Contract law is the most litigated law. Try not to get involved in this because you certainly don't want to go, well, we offered this and the other side go, no, you didn't. Well, that's what we meant. Well, that's not what you wrote. That's why you haven't been educated fully as an attorney at law. So you have to just fill in blanks. I showed that to John and he laughed hysterically. He's like, I've never seen that. I'm like, really? How can a practicing attorney have never seen that example or that joke? All right. That is chapter two, discussing more terms like land and real property and real estate. So what I want you guys to do is go through and read behind me. Read the chapter tonight so that you understand. Do the quiz at the back of the book. Don't forget you have access to the online course, which has questions on the online for you as well. Tomorrow, before uh, we got about three days before we get to our first exam, tomorrow is going to start getting interesting. We're going to start talking about the estate in land or the degree of ownership, then we're going to get into the type of ownership. And those are often very confusing with people about the degree, the degree to which you own it, and then the type of uh, entity you take it in. And you can mix and match those. So please be sharp at the next course tomorrow, the next couple of days, because they are very confusing chapters that I end up explaining a lot outside of this course for people that didn't get it. Any questions about this chapter today? Shauna? Yeah, just out of curiosity, you said that like um, states like Arizona, Nevada, Utah, they do a uh, prior appropriate, uh, appropriation, right? Yes. So, if the state owns only the water and just miraculously, like you said, if that water was to dry up, like if I found gold on my land through that waterbed, that is now mine. The state doesn't have any rights to that, right? Typically, or is that if the doctrine of prior appropriation, you got the water, the state would appropriate the water. This land could still be yours. Okay. So if okay. you found gold down here, then probably even with the doctrine of prior appropriation, that would be your property. It's the water that you cannot have. Okay. okay. It's this. Oh, That's so what they appropriate. All right. Got it. Now, I will tell you, I'm not an expert at that because I, I understand the basic concept. I've read up a little bit about it. Uh, it would be a good question to know if that's ever happened. Uh, my assumption is uh, if I found it while panning in their water, I would flip it out on the shore and go, holy shit, look, there's gold over there. That's my land. I guess I own it there. That way, there would be nobody that knew that I found it in the water. That's what I do. And that you're not panning with somebody else that may have to remember that because you know the old story, two can keep a secret if one of them is dead. That was Benjamin Franklin's uh, statement. All right, any questions about that? This is getting fun, there's gold. Um, I can't draw very well. The only thing I used to be able to draw pretty good was it's a very bad rendition of Fred Flintstone. Flintstone. All right. 
if there's no other questions, I'm done for the day. I will be here. If you have questions, text me. Until then, I guess I shall see you tomorrow. Uh, and we'll like to.